is yours. Okay. All right. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yoshi Naizumi, who will be giving our lecture today. Dr. Naizumi is a self-described paleoecologist, erstwhile archaeologist, and fire scientist, specializing in the legacies of human and fire use, uh, land, land and fire use, sorry, on modern forest ecosystems. Uh, Dr. Mezumi obtained her PhD in geography from the University of Utah and completed a postdoc in archaeology at the University of Exeter. She's currently a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Amsterdam, an Honorary Research Fellow at the University of Exeter, and a National Geographic Explorer. Dr. Mezumi has graciously agreed to speak to us today about her research into human environment interactions and the creation of Amazonian landscapes. Uh, Dr. Mezumi, welcome to the Bourne Symposium, and the screen is all yours. Great, thanks so much, and um, thanks again for having me uh, and everybody tuning in today. I am going to adjust our gallery view. Not that I don't want to see all of your lovely faces. Okay, there, I'll just minimize you. Mm, okay, there we go. So yes, <clears throat> as Elizabeth said, I'm gonna be chatting with you today about some of our ongoing research that's been going on in the Amazon. Um, so original talk title, I think, was The Origins of Amazonian Landscapes. And I looked at that this morning. And I was like, well, that's not very interesting. So I thought I'd add a little bit more explaining the uh, descriptors in the title. Uh, fire, fields, and fertilizer exploring the origins of Amazonian landscapes. <clears throat> And I'll kind of walk you through some of the methodologies that we have been using to explore human interactions in the Amazon uh, over the last few decades. So for those of you not familiar with kind of the ongoing research that's been, uh, we've been going on down in the Amazon, um, the paradigm for the majority of the 20th century was that the Amazon was essentially a pristine ecosystem. Uh, if humans were there, they were uh, likely very low density populations. Therefore, the impact that they had on the environments was likely marginal, uh, pretty minimal in, uh, in scale. Uh, Betty Medgar is one of the famous uh, archaeologists at the Smithsonian Institution actually argued that the Amazon was in fact what was called a counterfeit paradise, which means that uh, essentially as a result of all of the um, various things in the Amazon that could either eat, poison, stab, or kill you, um, anything from, you know, cro crocodiles to um, vector-borne dis diseases from mosquitoes, um, the Amazon was essentially a human death trap. Um, additionally, the poor for fertility in the Amazon soils uh, led her to argue that basically it wasn't possible for humans to be able to sustain larger populations because of the nutrient limit limitations and therefore resource limitations in the Amazon. Now, as a result, uh, one of the unintended and unintended consequences of deforestation in the last few decades is that there have been increased um, archeological sites identified underneath forests that we previously thought were pristine, quote unquote, air quotes, pristine here. And so um, as more and more of these large archeological sites under the forest began to be identified, it led uh, some researchers to argue that perhaps the Amazon was much more influenced by humans than we previously thought. Uh, this led scholars like um, Mike Heckenberg and Clark Erickson to argue that perhaps the Amazon was uh, an anthropogenic landscape or essentially a cultural parkland. And so if we think then about the Amazon, uh, roughly the Amazon basin, roughly the size of the 48, the lower 48, of the United States, it kind of gives us an idea of how big this area is. So if we start asking these questions about, okay, were we pristine or, or were we parkland? Um, where, or how can we actually start to probe this question and tease apart these types of um, these types of uh, data from archives to to be able to explore this kind of dichotomy, right? <clears throat> so again, our pristine uh, wilderness would be the assumption we have very few people, very minimal impact on the landscape, whereas our cultural parkland, more people, much uh, broader impact on the landscape. So really, where are we falling within this gradient? Is it something we can generalize to the Amazon, or is it more case-by-case -case specific bases or particularly, re particularly regions in the Amazon that are being more influenced than others? So this has kind of set it up, uh, set up the, the majority of my research for about the last 10 years, really interested in how humans have shaped these Amazonian ecosystems. And then uh, particularly my interest is in fire as one of the most powerful transformative tools we have to change landscapes or 
really, what are the ecological la legacies of these changing fire regimes? <clears throat> so, if we think about the history of human presence in the Amazon, um, relatively young human history. So we have the arrival of humans um, about 15,000 years ago. I'm going to talk to you about a bit more about that in just a moment. But if we then start thinking about from the onset of human activity, how did human activity change um, through time up towards present? And what are some different types of land use interactions, human environment interactions that we might see in the paleo record? So our original early colonizers, likely hunter-gatherer, fisher-forager types of communities. And when humans arrive on the landscape, we tend to increase the incidence of fire, right? So bring fire with us, uh, use it for numerous types of reasons, anything from cooking to clearing landscapes. Uh, potentially, we might see something like forest management. Are they uh, managing natural resources occurring in, in the forests, um, perhaps changing forest composition? And then we'll start to see some more of these intensive type human environment interactions, such as domestication of plants and or cultivation of plants. Um, numerous plants that have been uh, documented that were domesticated within the Amazon. I'm going to go into a bit more detail with you today. I'll just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we are starting to get these more intensive types of uh, environmental interactions. In the Amazon, we also have a lot of evidence of soil improvement or fertilization of those nutrient poor soils that I mentioned before that are, um, Betty, Betty Medgers argued that were a limiting factor of human populations in the Amazon. And then lastly, uh, monumental types of architecture. So landscape construction, uh, something you might have um, heard of before, like raised field agriculture, that type of thing that's kind of characteristic, to, characteristic of some of the communities in the Americas. And then once we have the arrival of Europeans, European colonization, about 1500 uh, Cal uh, AD, how do we see the changes from indigenous types of human environment interactions to more um, European style human environment interactions? And again, as we're thinking about this on kind of like a gradient scale, as we're moving towards the right of these kind of concepts, these big human environment interactions, we would assume that the intensification uh, in the paleo record would show up more towards the right hand side. Now, how do we start looking at, at the past for archive records to detect these different types of land use practices. So here we've got an idealized landscape uh, of the Amazon rainforest with a lake there on our left-hand side. Now, <clears throat> for those of you not familiar with paleoecology, uh, we're going to be looking at lake sediment cores um, surrounded by, let's say, vegetation. We'll assume that a fire occurs on the landscape that fire obviously combusts the vegetation, produces charcoal. That charcoal winds up on the surface of the lake, settles down to the bottom, and begins to accumulate through time. Uh, similarly, all of the vegetation that's flowering around the lakes, pollen, winds up in the lake, settles down, and again, accumulates just like the charcoal. So if we then go out and collect these sediment cores, ideally what we can start to then look at is changes in our fire activity from the charcoal and vegetation from the pollen through those layers in the sediment and start to understand how these ecosystems around the lake, kind of on a broader regional scale, were changing through our depositional record. Now let's head on shore. <clears throat> Some of the terrestrial archives that we can look at, for example, archaeobotany. Uh, now, archaeo, obviously associated with humans, archaeology, and then botany, plant remains. So these are going to be the plants specifically that are associated with those archaeological sites. Uh, one of uh, the common proxies that archaeobotanists archeo use are called phytoliths. Uh, so Latin derivative from plant, phyto, and then lith is stone. So basically little plant stones. Um, so these are going to be formed by dissolved silica in the waters, uptaken by the plant um, through plant absorption, and then the silica within the water makes little tiny casts of the cellular structure of the plant. So basically when the plant dies, all the natural organic stuff biodegrades, you're left with these little uh, rock casts, basically silica rock casts of the cellular structure of the plants, to give you a really good idea of what was growing 
on the landscape. And since they're stones, essentially silica stones, they're very heavy and they tend not to be deposited very far away. So basically plants grow there, that's where your phytoliths are deposited. So a very local scale. So we can then compare those archaeobotanical samples with our pollen samples and we get an idea about spatial change, right? Locally disturbed, regionally disturbed. And as I mentioned, my uh, particular passion is looking at this through a human lens. So, of course, if we can find archaeological features around the landscape, that'll give us an indication of what humans were doing. Uh, so, for example, here we've got material culture like ceramics. Uh, was there, let's say, a material culture characterized by a certain kind of ceramic type of land use different than, let's say, another type a uh, different period in time, a different material culture, potentially even a different group of people um, interacting with the environment. Now, to understand all of these proxies, we need to have an idea of what was going on around us climatologically. So one of the proxies that we use down in the Amazon are, um, are called speleothems, and these are going to be our deposits from caves that give us a good indication of what past changes were happening in terms of precipitation. And so in the Amazon, the major fluctuations we see since the last glacial period is associated with precipitation. So these, these cave records give us a good idea if things were getting wetter and or drier through time. And again, all of that will be set against the backdrop to understand vegetation changes, fire changes, human interactions with the environment. So for today, I'm going to zoom down to the southwestern part of the Amazon. <clears throat> so here, located in that pink circle, is going to be one of our study sites that I've been working on for the past few years called Laguna Versailles. And our inset there map is giving us an idea of the lake. Uh, and then those numbers around the lake are giving um, indication of where we took those archaeobotanical samples, the uh, lake sediment cores, as well as the excavations. And so the majority of the data that we'll see here today is going to be associated with this particular uh, study site. So again, thinking about our timeline in terms of human environment interactions. Human colonization, uh, although we do have some earlier dates, the majority of um, archaeological data are indicating humans arrived in the Amazon about 15,000 years ago. And as I mentioned, these are primarily going to be our hunting, gathering, fishing, foraging communities. And right around this transition from the last glacial period, um, and I think I am not sure if Jacqueline's here today, but I'm sure she's talked to you a lot um, and given you a you have an idea of what's going on during the last glacial period. So for our purposes here today, I'll just say, you know, we changed from the last glacial period to the current um, geologic area we are in now around oh, 11,000 years ago. And then during this transition, uh, as humans are coming down into the South America, we also have the extinction of our megafauna, that big um mass extinction of most of our charismatic megafauna, uh, mammoths, sloths, etc. And while this is a fascinating topic that I could spend a whole day just chatting with you about, and I'm sure Jacqueline has uh, covered before, um, the, the, for our purposes here, we're going to be focusing on, okay, humans arrive, animals go extinct, not talking about drivers here today for that one, but um, then um, the areas where we find our earliest archaeological sites are in these specific regions of the Amazon where the rainforest vegetation begins to transition into our more seasonally dry forest or grassland savannas. And the hypothesis right now is that as these um, migratory peoples were coming into the Amazon, they were exploiting this wide range of resources. And so right at that ecotone region between the, the rainforest and savanna, lots of different types of ecosystems that they could exploit, lots of different resources. And so these were the hotspots where we were starting to find our earliest evidence of humans occupying. <clears throat> Now, if we were to then zoom into a cross section of what this looks like, let's imagine our rainforest is there on our left and moving into that dry forest or savanna on our right hand side. Now, fire, uh, again, I'm going to use the, the, the lens of fire because you know, it's a really good indicator in the past that um, you know, potentially humans were using fire on the landscape. But how can we then start to think about fire in a natural sense and fire in potentially a human influenced sense? So on our rainforest, left-hand side, um, the majority of natural caused fire is going to be ignited by lightning. Now, 
if you imagine then if you found you can kind of picture a triple story rainforest um, vegetation is very moist um, a lot of the moisture within the, the amazon is all recycled uh, so within the canopy it's very 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 humid um, if we were to strike that vegetation with lightning it's very unlikely that that vegetation would actually catch fire uh, enough to cause let's say a wildfire event because the vegetation fuel moisture is so high now, alternatively, if we were to strike the lightning over to the right hand side where our savanna, or our dry forest vegetation is much more likely that we would have an ignition from lightning that would cause some sort of wildfire event. Now, once we introduce humans onto the landscape, there tends to be an increase in the incidence of fire. Uh, as I mentioned, numerous different reasons why humans are going to be using fire on the landscape, but as humans arrive and they start to increase the frequency of fires, the vegetation will slowly, potentially sometimes not quite so slowly, uh, transition from being fire adverse, okay, so not fire adapted, towards being more fire prone in composition. Uh, now we can generalize this into what's being called pyrophobic, so that would be our rainforests, into more pyrophytic, and that would be our more like dry adapted, fire adapted type vegetation. Uh, again, this is a kind of complex ecological response, but essentially, if you imagine repeated fires are going to be reducing those fire intolerant plants, uh, fire intolerant seed banks, and then over time, what's left over is the stuff that can survive fire frequent, frequent fires, and so that, that vegetation will start being more dominant. <clears throat> so, if we then start to think about this in terms of our lake paleo data, right? So we've taken those sediment cores, we've looked at the layers in the sediment here, and what we're looking at here is an example of what some charcoal data from a sediment core is going to look like. So on our y-axis, that's going to be age. So up at the top is going to be zero, that would be modern. And we're moving back through time. And so this record, as an example, is about 6,500 years old. And then you'll notice that as our black histogram bars start to increase, that'll mean that we have more charcoal coming into our sediments versus less charcoal. Now, once we have these types of age depth charcoal relationships, we can do statistical analyses on these data to create what's called fire frequency records or reconstructions. And so what we're looking at here in our orange uh, to yellow to orange um, line graph is a example of how many fire, fire episodes, let's say periods of increased burning, uh, were occurring through this record. And we're smoothing this over a thousand year window. So when our records are long enough, we can actually take some nice kind of averages through time. And so you'll notice that around 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, we have what we'll call peak fire frequency. So that'll mean that we have the most frequent fires being burned on the landscape. Um, now, the question then becomes, are these fires natural, let's say, example, lightning caused fires, or are these fires influenced by humans? Now, one of the ways that we can start getting at this, particularly in the Amazon, fortunately for us at this particular site, we had the evidence of crops being cultivated around the lakeshore. So what we're looking at here, the small yellow circles are representing where we found maize pollen from uh, corn. And then our pink square is going to be our sweet potato pollen. And so we have evidence that multiple crops are being cultivated at this particular site. But in order, again, to contextualize this against a climate backdrop, I'm going to put up here the... Um, paleoclimate record from Pumacocha. And on our right hand side there down at the bottom, that's going to be indicating drier conditions. And then as we move up towards up towards present, the blue conditions are indicating wetter conditions. And so you can see that where we have that peak fire frequency, so the most the increase in the charcoal coming in, the most frequent fires occurring on the landscape, not too much is really significantly changing with our climate there. It's actually kind of hovering right around the dead point or the dead center of the, those those climate data. So likely, you know, a big climate fluctuation, we would assume in this type of ecosystem, more fire would be associated with drier conditions. And so because the climate is holding pretty constant, but you'll see the maize cultivation starts to intensify. So that means that we have more of those little yellow circles. So we have more maize being cropped around the lake. Likely in this condition or in this particular situation, we would attribute the fire activity, increased fire frequency with human 
um, drivers, particularly associated with that maize cultivation. Now, for those of you who haven't seen um, crop pollen, I thought I'd just throw this up because it's really beautiful. And so a lot of our data have shown that in the Amazon, they weren't relying on a single type of crop. So as I mentioned in the last uh, figure, we saw both sweet potato and maize pollen identified, but there are other crops as well that we often identify, including manioc and squash. And so when we find records where there's multiple crops being cultivated, uh, the term that we use is called polyculture. Now, this essentially means that there's multiple crop cultivation going on at a, at a single site. So if we were to then put all of those data together, the fire data, the crop pollen data, and make that into more of like a visual representation, this is how I'm envisioning it, right? So lake over there on our right-hand side, fires are being burnt around the lakeshore, and that area where the uh, nutrient-rich soils from the lake soils are being, uh, from the lake sediments, are being cultivated for crop cultivation uh, just around the 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 lake shore. Um, now, one thing I didn't mention about those crop pollen is that uh, crop pollen tends to be very large. So if we were to use uh, the analogy um, of like, let's say, um, ping pong ball, let's say the average pollen grain is the size of something like a ping pong ball. Um, a crop pollen grain is going to be something more the size of like a volleyball or a basketball. So in terms of, you know, just sheer size, the, the larger grains, those larger crop uh, domesticated grains tend not to go as far. So if we find maize or uh, manioc um, pollen around our lakeshore, it's very indicative that crops are being cultivated just around or right near the lake because it's just not likely it's going to be able to be dispersed very far. So again, here in this instance, while we're assuming that cultivation of those crops is happening right around that lakeshore. So let's think about forest management. Okay, so we we're talking about first that fire use, fire management, and now forest management. So we're looking at that same record, but I'm going to be zooming in now from in the last record was 6,500 years shown. Here I'm going to be zooming into the last 2,000 years. Again, age on our y-axis there, and those black bars representing those charcoal layers that we analyzed through the sediment core. Again, those statistics telling us how frequent fires were happening. And now here, what I've done is summarized all of those pollen data that uh, we took from the lake core. So um, I, was, I, I opted not to put up the whole pollen diagram. Um, if you haven't seen a full pollen diagram, you're really missing out. They can be um, quite a lot to digest if you're not familiar with all the different types of plant taxa. So what I've done here is simplified all of the trees into the green, dark green color all of our palms into that light green color, and then our herbs, so grasses, um, weeds, slower herbaceous stuff growing around the lake is gonna be in our beige color, um, just kind of right there on the, the left-hand side of that graph. And again, we have those same crops, the maize in yellow and the sweet potato in pink. And again, there's our climate record. So an area in the figure I want you to take a look at is this increase in fire activity period about 1800 to 1200 uh, years ago. Now, something that jumped out to me in this record was that about 15% increase in palms during this period. Again, that's going to be our light green color. Now, for um, these particular species of palms, and I, mean, I kind of can't, can't have, to, have to take my word for it here because you didn't see the whole pollen diagram, the type of palm is actually called atalea. And so for a lot of these um, types of palms that are uh, have large fruits and they are exploited um, both by animals and humans in the Amazon, um, they actually respond quite well to fire, whereas some of the other rainforest taxa, you burn it and it's going to be adverse for those, those plants. Palms, uh, particularly Atalea, um, actually produces more fruit and uh, responds post-fire to increased reproductive um, success. And so we would call this type of plant pyrophytic again. And so the increase in fire activity we see at this period associated with that increased maize cultivation also likely increased the um, the abundance of palms that they were being you know, being used as a resource as well. So increasing the subsistence loads. Now, just a little side note, and again, I'm not going to go into the, the megafauna decline, but a lot of these types of palms and these types of uh, large fruiting plants down in the Amazon were originally uh, co-evolved with these large um, 
herbivore type critters. So for example, mammoths and sloths and things like that. Um, when they went extinct around about 10,000 years ago, the reproduction of these types of uh, plants would have been limited. And so likely humans play an important role here in stepping in and helping the continued reproduction, reproductive success of these um of these plants post you know critters being gone on the landscape <clears throat> so again let's conceptualize this on the landscape so here now you'll notice our vegetation is shifted from kind of that tropical rainforest lots of trees and palms to more of a palm dominated fire adapted or pyrophytic type of uh, vegetation and again, likely associated with those humans on the landscape uh, using hmm, or potentially managing the forest, uh, practicing what we call agroforestry um, by enriching the food crops and utilizing fire to increase subsistence yields off those those um, edible plants. All right, so let's talk now about that soil improvement. So again, the, uh, the addition to uh, soil enrichment or fertilization of those soils. Now, as I mentioned, the natural soils in the Amazon, very nutrient poor. Uh, depending on where you're, where you're located globally, these can either be referred to as ferrisols or oxisols, but essentially they're going to be very clay rich, nutrient poor soils. So here's a little schematic of what those soils might look like. Very high in um, metals, they're leached of nutrients because of all the heavy precipitation we have in the tropics. Um, very difficult to crop on these types of, uh, of soils um, because of the reduced fruit fertility. Now, alternatively, there is a anthropogenic and anthropogenic soil in the Amazon known as Amazonian dark earth soils. Now, these soils, uh, the hypothesis is that they are formed over extended human occupation, and they are associated with all sorts of human indicators, ceramics, uh, food waste, mm, crop plants, waste material from crops, and lots and lots of charcoal. And so the hypothesis is humans are there, they're settled for a long time, kind of using these uh, areas as uh, potentially middens. So these are fancy word for like trash heaps, <laughs> and then burning those uh, middens over time, getting rid of the refuse. And then that enriches the soils. You can turn the soils up. And then through time, we start to develop this really nice organic rich soil um, that then was likely later exploited for crop cultivation because of these really high nutri nutrient loads in, in the soils. So if we then think about the archaeobotanical soil profiles next to our archaeological sites. Uh, again, we saw lots of charcoal and different types of crops that were planted, uh, that were associated with these soils. Uh, so here we have, um, as you recall from the pollen data, we saw that we had sweet potato and we had maize. Uh, now with the phytoliths, again, those little plant stones that I was telling you about and that we were finding in the soils, we found also the addition of manioc in, in the soil profiles. So we weren't picking up the manioc uh, around the lakeshore, but we were finding the manioc in our soil profiles near the archeological site. And so what we're looking at there on the right-hand side is going to be our, uh, soil profile, and you'll notice that Y now this time is actually on depth uh, versus the last figures, those last figures were on age. Now this is because um, our soils don't have that same nice continuous deposition that we have in our in our lake sediments. And so oftentimes we can date soils, but because they, uh, we already know that humans were likely there and churning that soil up, it does tend to decrease the temporal resolution of our soils. But here in this, for example, meter deep soil profile, we were able to get three radiocarbon dates. Um, they're in order, so it's likely you know, old stuff should be at the bottom, younger stuff should be at the top. And you'll see there on the far right hand side that there's three radiocarbon dates associated with the soils. Similar to our pollen data, I've summarized all trees into dark green and then the herbs into beige. Now, again, our crop pollen is going to be small yellow circles maize and then our little purple diamond here is now going to be manioc and so you'll see that uh, the fire activity increases about 60 centimeters up to 20 centimeters we have continuous presence of those crops throughout the whole record and as our fire activity starts to increase we actually see an increase in herbs uh, around around the the site which makes sense you know if we're opening up more space we'll have a slight decline in our arboreal cover 
and those herbs will increase um, in the record as well. <clears throat> so if we again put this onto a landscape type of uh, conception, we have the cropping that was originally going on around the lake. And during this period of crop intensification, this was happening uh, at our site, at our Versailles site, about 1600 to 700 years ago, uh, we have the increased nutrient um, loads or nutrient richness from the ADE development to enable the crop cultivation, not just around the lake shore where the lake sediments are nutrient rich, but expanding that out into the village, the archeological village, uh, where we see then the increased um, crop production and the addition of manioc into the, the subsistence strategies that were being used. And then as, as we saw before, fires are occurring around the lake shore and now also associated with the development of those ADEs and crop cultivation in the village. <clears throat> so as we move then towards that kind of peak uh, impact uh, that we would be able to detect on the landscape in terms of those human environment actions go, the landscape construction. Um, as I mentioned, we are finding in increased massive archeological sites underneath those areas of forest that were previously forested. So here we're looking at an aerial photograph of uh, one of these areas, for example, that um, you can see kind of those faint outlines of circles and squares and maybe some kind of lines that are cut cutting through the, the, the figure there and if or the image there. And just to kind of give you a highlight of kind of what we're seeing, what I'm seeing when I look at this figure, these are the uh, examples, types of examples of how complex these archaeological sites and features are on the landscape. And these can range anything from raised fields, uh, causeways, fish weirs, ring ditches, monumental mounds, et cetera. So really a, a whole wide range of these types of large archeological features have been identified uh, in this particular area of the Amazon. So at our site in Laguna Versailles, uh, we had the identification of one of those ring ditch villages, uh, those ring ditch features. And so here we have a human, a little, so you can kind of see a tiny little gray human to give you an idea of how large these are uh, in terms of scale. So they're going to be a double ring ditch feature. Uh, so you can kind of see there's two big ditches that were being constructed around the villages. And these double ditch profiles are typically associated with fortification, so defensive features. Now, within those ring ditches, uh, we excavated an uh, archaeological profile. And this is a kind of cartoon uh, description of what the different types of soils look like and the types of ceramics that are being identified at this site. So for scale, some of this, like just to give you an idea of how massive some of these ceramic features were, um, that is a... Uh, uh, one of our archaeologists, she's about my height to give, well, I guess that doesn't help because you can't see how tall I am, uh, about 5'3", um, how big these huge storage vessels were for likely uh, food storage. Now, um, one of our, our co-authors, uh, one of our collaborators has developed a new ceramic chronology from these excavations. Uh, and this will help us again understand how material culture has changed through time. And the, there are three phases that were identified. So the oldest phase, the Chocolatal phase, is about 2,500 years ago to 1,600 years ago. The next ceramic phase, the early Versailles phase, 1,600 to about seven. And then the most recent phase, the late Versailles, about seven to 300 years ago. And so we can use these features then, or these ceramic material cultures, to, to start understanding how the, the land use interactions changed through time. So thinking about this most recent period, the double ring ditch feature was developed, or let's say constructed during the late Versailles phase. So again, let's think about how this is going to look on the landscape. <clears throat> so during this period, again, we're moving more towards present. During this latest period of human occupation, we have abandonment of crop cultivation around the shore. So humans are moving from uh, cultivating kind of more open types of village construction to the construction of those double ring ditches and the shift from crop cultivation around the site to inside the closed feature and inside the, the ring village. So again, as I mentioned, these are typically associated with fortification. Likely what's going on is that uh, they were starting to become more defensive uh, and they were bringing the resources more close to the village so they could be um, protected against to, to fortify against likely uh, increased social conflict. 
uh, this this development of these double ring uh well, let's say increased fortification is a amazon wide amazon wide thing during this time period so we see kind of across this region of the amazon increased uh, evidence of um, social strife indicated by these types of fortification structures now interestingly uh, this actually happens during a period in time where climates are wetter than present and you know, for a lot of these uh, hypotheses that have been posed for you know increased uh, social conflict, it's typically associated. Well, let's say for example, like the Maya, typically associated with uh, periods of drought, right? And that drought causes crop failures and then increased social strife. Uh, so potentially down in this area of the Amazon, it could be some sort of human response to or social response to increased flooding. All right, so if we're flooding more of the areas of land, potentially there's less areas to crop, uh, villages are getting flooded out, and so people are moving around that way. Or there are areas further afield where it is actually drier that are, you know, then shifting towards areas that are staying wetter, kind of more like large migrations of people. And we do see a pretty large migration of, of, of people based on the ling linguistic evidence uh, around this time period of people moving across this region of the Amazon. So still ideas that we're, we're playing with and kind of probing at, but that kind of gives you an idea of what um, the types of, of Kind of state of the art of where we're at in our in our research right now, and the types of questions that we're kind of working on answering. So <clears throat> our paleo data leaves us right at the uh, arrival, kind of transitioning that arrival of European uh, col colonists to the Americas. So we've just had a paper accepted in Science, uh, led by Mark Bush, looking at the impact of Europeans on uh amazon kind of in general so there has been hypothesized that when europeans arrive um, as a result of uh, european disease there's about a 90 to 95 percent uh loss population collapse of indigenous communities in the americas throughout the americas and so this uh population decline lets has led some researchers to propose that the um massive uh, decline and then absence of humans on the landscape led to a large regrowth of vegetation and this regrowth in vegetation would have sequestered more carbon and that has been proposed to be the driver of the little ice age which is the cool period we see about 1500 to 1800 um, AD. Now what we've done in this uh, in this paper is synthesize all of the available pollen data throughout the Amazon. I think we have a total of 39 records and look at whether or not we see humans, the human population decline and that regrowth of vegetation in uh, to, to, to kind of test this hypothesis. So I'll leave it at that. I won't do the spoiler alert yet, but no, uh, that's in the works and it should be out uh, in the next few weeks. I think it's uh, April 29th. That's going to be available for, um, for uh, embargo, but I'm going to just, you know, drop that one there as a little... <laughs> Plug. Um, okay, so let's summarize all of that stuff. Where are we at with the state of the Amazon research? So we know humans arrive about 15,000 years ago into the Amazon, start to spread out quite quickly. The megafauna, or coincidentally, the megafauna uh, extinction occurs. And those early humans occupying that seasonal, um, excuse me, the uh, ecotonal regions between the rainforest and the savanna, likely exploiting fishing, foraging, natural fruits and nuts, trees of, of the Amazon. Uh, of those ecotonal regions, Brazil nut, acai, etc. Early on, we're seeing now the domestication of crops. Uh, for example, some of the more charismatic crops, manioc, squash, sweet potato, happening around 10 to 9,000 years ago. And the Amazon has now been identified as a separate center for domestication. Multiple crops, these are just some of the kind of ones relevant to uh, the research I was talking about today. Now, depending on the terminology we want to use, fire use slash management influenced by humans happens quite early, about let's say 7,000 years ago. And then we have the earliest evidence of our ADE formation uh, occurring around this time as well, about 6,000, 7,000 years ago. Now, a maize arrives into the Amazon about this time as well, originally domesticated in Mexico, but then comes down into the Amazon as a semi-domesticated form, which means it's not quite fully domesticated maize, but uh, once those semi-domesticates arrive, they then spread out and are domesticated in situ around different areas of the Amazon. And then as we're moving more towards present on the right-hand side, we then see the wide distribution of those ADEs around the Amazon. Uh, 
and the construction of those more monumental size uh, features. So that will be the, uh, the raised fields, causeways, um, roads, fish weirs, et cetera. And then lastly, that arrival of Europeans about 500 years ago and how that uh, decline in the indigenous populations has, has impacted uh, vegetation response on kind of a more regional scale. And again, more on that in a little bit. So are there insights now that we could be taking from our research that could inform, let's say, sustainable futures or management decisions in the Amazon moving forward? We know, again, this history of human arrival, uh, the early forms of, of, of land use and fire use, uh, the more intensification, more intense, uh, the intensification of soil amelioration techniques, the crop, crop cultivation of multiple kinds of plants. Um, using this now long durée, it's almost more than 10,000 years that humans have been there in some degree or another, domesticating plants, exploiting natural resources in the forest, using uh, practicing agroforestry. Um, are there lessons that we can be then taking from these types of really long-term human, uh, human resource management to start to inform our, our, our decision-making processes moving forward, right? So today we know that um, clear-cutting deforestation for um, large swaths of the Amazon for single crop cultivation like soya or clearing lands for cattle grazing is not sustainable. So are there ways that we can start to integrate these lessons from the past where people have been around for 10,000 years or more uh, quite, you know, potentially intensively utilizing the landscape that we can use to inform our, our decisions moving forward. Uh, so with that, I think I'm just about out of time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you might have them. Thanks for your attention. Hey, thank you, Dr. Mizumi. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, could, could you Perhaps take down the slides and we can see each other all. Sure thing. That's not my question, but I thought. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, thank you for an absolutely fascinating and, and very well presented talk with all on really cutting edge research. I look forward to seeing your paper in science. Congratulations on that. I've thank been you. reading, so I've been reading work by Crystal McMichael, Dolores Paperno, and, and their colleagues, and they're arguing based on their field work that the forest management, the Amazonian dark earths, and, and deforestation in general are limited to the locations where people were living along watercourses on the lakes and, and perhaps around these ring villages, but were not widespread across the Amazon, which would have, of course, raised some questions about the reforestation and how much impact that would have had on the onset of the Little Ice Age. So I wonder if you had a perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I actually am in the same lab as Crystal now, so I'm very familiar with her work. And th so there, I think this kind of goes back to the um, the slide that I showed with the the size of the Amazon is basically give or take the size of the the continental U.S. Right. And so to make assumptions now, I mean we we have maybe like four or five really well dated high resolution sites, really near very very densely occupied archaeological settings. And so I think what our research are doing is is creating a baseline of, of, of how intense, like if, we, if it's a most intense, right, if we're on this side of the spectrum of how intense pos possibly human occupation could have been, um, that's the areas that I've been really particularly interested in studying. So here down in this, this portion of the Amazon and then up near kind of the Eastern Amazon, near the, um, the archeological sites of Santhanam, we're getting the baseline spectrum of kind of most extreme. And so a lot of Crystal's work and her new, um, um, European Research Grant Council is looking at um, the Western Amazon, which right now has probably the biggest blank on the map. So if you're kind of thinking about the U.S., it would be like basically if we cut the U.S. in half, it's all this portion of the West in the Northwest uh, that we basically don't have any data points. And so her current research now is looking specifically at those areas to try and fill in the blanks on the map. Um, in terms of the site locations just being centered um, near the fluvial or uh, the river channels. Um, there have been, and this is kind of, there's been some debate about this. So 
it depends on what you de like de technically define as a river because within the Amazon, any direction you go, within probably 10 kilometers, you're going to hit some sort of river, whether or not it's a tributary or one of the massive tributaries of the Amazon or a, like kind of a smaller stream. You know, still in our in our circumstances, you wouldn't want to swim across it. These are massive rivers, even by the Amazon standards, they might be quite small. So, what is the interfluvial area that where people aren't living? So again, what people are working on doing now is trying to find spots within these interfluvial regions to see are there actually archaeological sites there that we can detect have, you know, if they haven't been flooded out by these kind of meandering rivers all over the Amazon. And then if people are there, what kind of is the extent of 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 um, disturbance. And so from the, the data that um, so I think one of the citations on there, Iriarte, summarized our, uh, the kind of the, all of the sites that our, our team looked at for about the last five years. And we see that where we're looking and where we find what might be considered an interfluvial site by some, some of these large river standards, we do find sites and we do find ADEs. And so it might be a little more complicated than just saying people aren't, people are here and not there without going and looking. And so I think, long story short, we might still need to fill in some of those points on the map <laughs> for sure for sure yeah i know i know what they've been doing is coring but how much you know how much can one team do um, coring yeah. in those interflues and every record's a point source which means there's a lot of untouched territory absolutely yeah. and you know just as a kind of example like one pollen record might take me eight months to generate once i get it back into the lab and so that's just for one single lake record and so you imagine the time investment it goes into creating these data sets is it's it, it's happening and we just need more people to do it so if anyone just want to go to paleoecology and study amazonian pollen <laughs> just join the team there's lots of, yeah, lots of yeah. spots on the map and just as a, just a historical note about 20 maybe a little over 20 years ago betty meggers came and gave a keynote talk for us towards the end of her career i think kirk Excellent. might be the only other one here who was who was there for that so great. it's so so nice to see this great update with all of the new I mean, the whole field has changed amazonian archaeology and paleoecology has changed so much in the last 20 years i really appreciate that thank you oh, yeah thanks i had a question Sure. Um, you mentioned that the defensive features kind of match up with the weather conditions. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then you mentioned that you might look into that further to see. And I, I'm just curious um, if that's a, if that's an area of interest and in how you'll go about looking to see if those match up with like local lake level change or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of also great research being done on paleoclimatology. The, the field of paleoclimate research in the Amazon is just taking leaps and bounds. And so, you know, since I've been working there really intensively in like the last 10 years, new speleothem records are popping up all over the place. Again, they, they take a long time to generate. You need to go and get the cores and all sorts of caving and finding the right one. And then you could get one and start analyzing it. And it's like, the wrong age and stuff. So they take a long time to generate, but fortunately um, we will have a speleothem record. I think it's in review right now. That's about um, 20 kilometers from this site. So we'll have an in situ climate record that's right next door. And then similarly up the kind of research we've been doing in the Eastern Amazon, we had a speleothem record that I think was 145,000 years, 70 kilometers from our site. And so we were able to really contextualize what climate was doing um, in C2. And, uh, Climatology in the Amazon is, is very complicated. It's not like once it's wet in one place, it's wet everywhere. There's a lot of spatial variability. So just within the Southwestern region, kind of in that pink circle that I was highlighting, you have what's uh, called climate antiphasing. And so on one side where it's getting wetter, the other side just kind of, you know, within five, 600 kilometers to the West might be drier. And so you have this kind of seesaw activity going on because um, there's lots of you know, different kind of complex climatological reasons for that. But where we are in the east, it's wet, but quite I'm mean, close, right? So it would be like the difference between, I don't know, uh, Vegas and California or something like that. Um, it, would be, it would be wet over there and dry over there. And so it's possible somewhere over there gets drier, people are moving around, then start to migrate to where the climate's more ideal, potentially optimal, things like that. Not sure. Um, it'll involve getting all of those climate records together and starting to look at spatial heterogeneity and then timing of changes in material culture. So potentially when do these do the, do the eastern, or let's say the western sites fortify first, and then the fortification moves temporally across that region? Or is it something more like everybody fortifies at once despite the climate, then it could be something that's not necessarily climatolo climatologically driven, but more socially driven. 
you know, if everybody's doing it at the same time everywhere without any kind of driver indicating it was specifically climate. Be yeah, a great question. It's still ideas to play with. Yeah, thanks. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm a I'm a diatomist. So I specialize in reconstructing lake levels. I'm curious Excellent. if you you know look at that kind of thing or. Yeah. So on our team, we didn't we didn't have a diatomist specifically on uh, working on this site, but I think now. Uh, Jose might have gotten a graduate student who wanted to look at diatoms on this lake record, and I can't remember. I know somebody was really interested in the geochemistry, but um, it's possible because that's a great way to uh, and then compare potentially the diatoms with the climate record gives you a really nice climate indicator as well. Great. Well, looks like an awesome project. Thanks. It really is remarkable to think that that 20, 22, 23 years ago, we didn't know about these sites. Yeah, I remember when when Mike Heckenberger was doing his PhD work. This was totally new. Mm -hmm. ha happened to be hanging around in Pittsburgh the, one of the years he was doing that. And, you know, things have yeah. changed. Yeah, so much, and it it's it's really neat because when I started my PhD, the paleo or the paleoecology perspective was that humans still had very little impact on the environment. And so, just during my five four years of PhD, it transitioned from okay, well, actually, maybe there there we are seeing something more humany. But like, kind of the theme of my my dissertation was like, oh no, I mean, humans couldn't have really caused a big impact. And then it was like, oh no, 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 just maybe keep looking. <laughs> so it's Fantastic. cool to to see that transition happen. I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the talk. That was really interesting to me. I, I know nothing about Amazon, uh, the Amazon region. So uh, I'm an Arctic person. So, um, but I, I, I work in the, the Alaska region a fair amount and I've spent a lot of time around the Yukon River and I feel like there's some potential uh, analogs there in terms of the, the river systems. How dynamic are the, the river systems and the lake systems in terms of uh, water movement and and changing dra uh, drainage. I guess it, you know it's probably topography driven. I assume, but and I assume that has a big impact on where you find uh, previous evidence of settlements and where you don't find it because it's washed out. Is that mm. a safe assumption? Yep, absolutely. So it uh, it completely depends on where you are in the Amazon, um, whether you're on the Amazonian shield, kind of the Brazilian shield, or you're kind of down in the lowlands, right, where it transitions towards the ecotone, right, because they'll have completely different uh, kind of fluvial, but the fluvial geomorphology is huge in terms of shaping the landscape. And I mean, these lakes or these rivers meander like huge and very quickly, and then the vegetation grows back so fast, you might see like, you know, even within, you know, some of the... Um, like if you go to Google Earth and you just look at the images and you kind of scroll back through time, you can see like, oh, that lake wasn't there before. And then basically they're like these oxbows that just really quickly, you know, get cut off and then grow back. And then so, you know, I think um, some of the teams, uh, another team in, uh, in England, Frank Mayles um, research group, uh, went out and cored a bunch of oxbows hoping they would be a few thousand years old. And they got them back and they had these beautiful long sediment cores they were so excited about. They wound up being like 500 years old. <laughs> So it didn't even cross. And it, I think they had like six or seven meters or something like that. So the sediment accumulation there was so, so high. So yeah, it can be very, very, very complicated. So for these lakes, they're very, very, very old lakes. So our basal dates on them are about um, 60, well, I mean, the, the, the limit of radiocarbon dating. So anywhere from 40 to 60,000 years old. Um, but our sediment cores are only about a meter and a half long. And so our temporal resolution when we have these really long records tends to be really low. So you, like ideally you find the Goldilocks lake sediment record that's, you know, getting enough sediment accumulation. You can ask the kinds of questions we're interested in about, you know, humans, 10,000 year records, et cetera, um, but aren't, um, aren't, too, aren't too low resolution and aren't too long resolution, you know. Um, and then there are specific, um, there, there's some really great geo, fluvial geomorphologists working uh, on, on, on mapping the changes in river courses through the Amazon and how changes in um, glacial ice melt and things like that would have fluctuated river channels coming kind of coming up into the Amazon and changed the river levels, which then caused different lakes to form here and there. Um, so there, yeah, there's some really neat mapping going on uh, in, terms of, in terms of that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We might have time for one more question. 
I had one, I think Joseph might have answered it for me or your exchange, but um, as, so I am looking at climate records from the highlands and the Andes and um, have used like the Pumacocha record and others. And um, one thing that I'm finding there is that the precipitation of course is only one part of the story. And up there, luckily there's glacial records that can kind of complement to provide more information about water balance overall. And so I was wondering what other proxies you might draw on from the Amazon. I, I mean, certainly I guess lake level would be another important one. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I, uh... The Pumacocha is not the best record to you, right? Because it's very far away. These records are so far apart from each other, but right now it's the only data, that's the closest data point we have. And so it's what we use to contextualize. So as I said, um, I'm not sure if you know uh, Francisco Cruz's team down at University of Sao Paulo, Chico Cruz. Um, his postdoc now, uh, research associate, um, Val, uh, Valdir Novello, is working on um, several speleothems kind of right in this region. And as I said, his, he, he and his master's student is, are going to publish a paleo, uh, speleothem record right next door. I mean, it's like 20 or 30 kilometers away, which is kind of what I've been waiting on for this year for, for one second, because I don't want to publish these data with the wrong climate and then have, you know, our climate interpretations change. So kind of holding off on that. But um, <clears throat> for... My current research, we were trying to pair speleothem data with leaf wax data. So to get at, um, high, high, so the deuterium in, in, in leaf waxes can give you an indication of plant stress. And so we were gonna do in situ proxies and you can get those out of lake sediments. And so we were gonna look at uh, leaf waxes in the, in the sediment core to see how stressed the vegetation was and then compare that with the speleothem data <clears throat> and to see if we are actually picking up, we could use then leaf waxes, potentially the deuterium as a in situ indicator in the area. Cause then we won't have to rely on speleothems in case you know there's not a cave nearby that we can actually find a climate record. Um, yeah, and as I, th was it Joe? Sorry, I don't see his picture anymore. Uh, talking about the, the diatoms can also give you an indicator of lake level. Um, and then I was just chatting with uh, one of my colleagues at Texas, and um, she just got Amiri Curie to look at a new proxy for um, using phytoliths. And it's going to be, I think, a chemical signature within phytoliths that might also be able to get at plant stress or hydrologic stress. But that's a whole new methodology she's working on developing for her new, new research grant. So, you know, keep an eye on that. Might yeah. be a new, brand new proxy coming out of her, her research. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're just at a minute left, um, so I think we'll have to end it here. But again, thank you, Dr. Mizumi, so much for coming and presenting your work. Your presentation is, I mean, I remember your slides just being so memorable. <laughs> and so I uh, appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. I spent a lot of time on them. It's what I do when I can't get through like a, a more complicated problem. Like, I'll just make pretty things in PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> it worked it really well. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks care, for having everybody. me. Take care. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Okay.